Hello, I'm Judy Stiles. Thank you for joining us this week on Newsmakers. Well, as we all know, this is an election year. You can't turn on the news without hearing about politics. And today, we're going to have a political discussion of our own on Newsmakers with some people from the Social Science, Political Science Department here at Missouri Southern who are very up on what's happening in the political science world and professors in the department. And I think to start off, I'd like to have each of you introduce yourself and explain the types of courses and how they tie into, you know, being aware of what's happening in election year. Sure. So, uh, well, well, thank you for having us. Um, my name is William Delahanty, uh, an Associate Professor of political science. I generally teach in uh, American politics um, and then in political theory. And the course uh, I'm currently offering, uh, in conjunction with the, the general government course, uh, is the American presidency course. Okay. And given the, you know, the ongoing you know, presidential <laughs> yes, nomination process, um, it's directly relevant by talking about nomination politics and ultimately the general election coming in November. Great. So we'll be hearing a lot from you, I'm sure, <laughs> as we come through the show. <laughs> I'm Nicole Schof, Assistant Professor of Political Science, and I teach a variety of American government and political uh, public policy courses, um, including state and local government. Okay, so uh, we have elections at all levels, so we'll be involved as well. Hi, Nick Nicoletti, Assistant Professor of Political Science, and I mostly teach the international relations classes here, but I also teach the introduction to government as well. Okay, and of course, government uh, political science is a course that students across the board take at Missouri Southern. Mm -hmm. It's a required course, mm -hmm. and so at that's least right. at the least they're all getting an introduction to the political yes. system. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's the value of the course. <laughs> the I value of letting help. people become aware. So on this program, of course, we're talking to not only students and faculty, but the general public, and I'd like to focus on some political issues, things that we're observing, and perhaps most recently we've had local politics. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the April elections, uh, we had school board elections, city elections. Um, I remember we hosted a forum where someone said, you know, remember this is one of the elections where the topics discussed affect you most. Mm -hmm. So let's talk from that perspective and person, the involvement of people in local elections. Any feedback on how you felt things went in April, just in generalizations? Well, um, I, I, you know, I noticed um, in several, there were a couple election contests where um, uh, people ran unopposed, um, where there were open seats. I mean, generally speaking, open seats kind of invite people to run um, and to be active uh, in local politics. So I was a little bit surprised by, um, you know, kind of the, um, not the lack of interest, but not necessarily having as many candidates as I was imagined. But generally, local politics tends to be um, kind of paradoxically something that citizens struggle with. They mm -hmm. tend to pay more attention to national as opposed to local politics. So you may not have that voter turnout in a local yeah. election that you anticipate. Yeah, voter turnout local elections is not unusual to see it in the 15 to 20 percent range, mm -hmm. um, which means you know one out of every five, if you're lucky, citizens who could vote show up and actually participate for the people who decide which potholes get fixed and whether your trash gets picked up on a regular basis and the local tax policies that affect you on a daily basis. So the things that people are talking about, they're not necessarily going out and voting to have a say. <laughs> Absolutely. Issues, and tying that together. And you know, the people that they're dealing with, perhaps in the, especially in the Joplin area where we had, I guess, turmoil in the last couple of years with yeah. the school board and the city council, exactly. but you didn't have a flood of candidates coming in to fill those positions. Well, and uh, in local politics with lower voter turnout, what you tend to see is uh, stronger influence from local interest groups and stakeholders um, like teachers unions and mm -hmm. chambers of commerce and things like that. And so the active public really takes the, takes the role. And, and what's really interesting, is, as uh, Professor Delahanty said, is that these are the things that affect us the most, um, but we tend to be... I don't think the word is apathetic. I think it's just uh, because there's less media attention, people are less aware. So it's a different nature of uh, elections, politicking. I mean, some, some people have used the term as a little more polite on the local level. Yeah, I mean, there, there is this kind of idea of uh, meeting people face to face, which is mm -hmm. something that's kind of interesting. Um, so it takes a, a certain type of person as a candidate and then as a voter to being willing to sustain you know, some of those costs you know, of time and energy, which can be hard for citizens. People are busy. So, mm -hmm. um, but it's still surprising, as Professor Schoff mentioned, that people aren't um, as interested, particularly as you mentioned, regarding you know issues of finances post tornado in Joplin. So there's some perplexities there. So from a political science perspective, is that something that you look at? You know, when you have these controversies, and a year later you don't have that big turnout at the election. What happened to that uprising we had a year ago? <laughs> I don't know that it surprises anybody anymore because we sort of know to expect it, which is sort of sad. Mm -hmm. um, but as Elhandi mentions, it. People are very busy. Um, I think the lack of partisan labels mm -hmm. in local elections mm -hmm. is also a barrier. Uh, partisan labels can be misleading. 
but they do provide a really great shortcut for citizens who are only marginally interested in politics, mm -hmm. and they just don't have that in local elections. When you're looking at city mm -hmm. council members, mm -hmm. they don't have the party labels attached to them. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little more effort. You're asking for more from your citizenry, citizenry to find out about these people. Mm -hmm. So we've had those elections that are behind us. There's still going to be issues, whether it's local sure. taxes, things like that, that come up all uh, on the local level. But mm -hmm. a lot of focus this year, we're turning to state and national elections. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, maybe some of our local candidates then become candidates down the road for state elections. Sure. Sure. Kind of a stepping stone. Yeah, recruitment <laughs> kind of from local to, uh, to state to national. So let's look at, for we're in Missouri, let's talk about the state of Missouri. Of course, our viewers also carry over to Kansas. But mm -hmm. looking at, you know, Missouri politics. Uh, right now, I've heard people say, well, well, I'm just first hearing who's running for governor you know it seems like you know that's not until November people aren't really worrying the John Q citizen from I've heard yeah. you know who's running for those positions well then the, the primaries um, for nominations you know are, are kind of upcoming too so it, it might also be that uh, with the kind of importance of the presidential election kind of in the background uh, maybe our people are more focused especially given the nature of the nomination process I, th I think that might be in part why citizens are Maybe di not distracted, but just focusing elsewhere. They're at least all initially. looking at the big picture yeah. of the national scene, yeah, not looking at the local. The now, Missouri, of course, we've had a lot of discussion in the state legislature about ethics and those types of things that are supposed to be issues. What is your reaction to those type of discussions coming out of places like Jefferson City? That's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you see that a lot everywhere. Missouri doesn't have a very professional legislature in the term that the formal scholars of mm -hmm. legislatures use. Um, so the pay is not really high. It's not a full-time job. Um, most people in the Missouri State Legislature have other ways of making money, uh, particularly in the fall uh, when they're not in session. And so the notion that you're going to have some ethical questions come up, particularly when you're dealing with uh, very new people working in legislature, is not unusual. What's the effect of term limits? And we've heard people comment about that on the statewide level. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, there's a, a potential ballot proposition that proposes to remove term limits right now for the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things term limits do is produce uh, turnover in the legislature. And so when you have legislators, um, it takes time to get uh, an understanding of the process, to get an understanding of the players, the system, um, and then just when people are starting to become more professionalized and starting to know their way around and building coalitions, uh, then they're term limited out and you get a, a new set of legisla legislators in. Sometimes political scientists call this um, amateur legislature issues uh, where it's harder to write bills and, and build coalitions because of turnover. Uh, the other thing about that is that interest groups have more influence in a high turnover legislative system because the interest groups don't turn over, right? They're always there. And so when you get new freshman uh, members of the General Assembly, their first contact is usually with the interest groups that try and solidify power. So removing term limits has, the research does show it, it's potentially beneficial for democracy, even though people generally support term limits. So that's a trend that you might see more discussion about. What, what are we going to do about term limits? Yeah, I mean, I mean um, Professor Nicoletti kind of underscores the, the importance. The other issue, too, is one of the questions of accountability. Mm -hmm. A lot of citizens sometimes get frustrated with the so-called career politicians, right. and so that really creates a strong argument in, in favor of you know, term limiting um, people. So I think um, there's actually a pretty lively debate among political scientists as to whether or not state legislatures should, in, you know, should embrace term limits. And have you found a, seen a trend of, okay, I have so many years in the House that when I finish up those terms, I'm going to say, let's run for the Senate, sure. or I'm going to go from sure. the Senate to a statewide office. Sure, you know? yeah. Well, and there, there, are, there are individual chamber limits within the General Assembly and then an aggregate total limit. So there's mm -hmm. actually kind of an incentive in the rules to transition from you know, one chamber to the next and ultimately, you know, to go to, you know, a statewide race or a national. Mm -hmm. yeah. So kind of that way it's operating. Now, when it comes to talk about politics and partisan, bipartisan, how do you characterize, like, the state of Missouri? You know, right now we have a Democratic governor, Republican a General Assembly. You know, how do you deal with that from a political science perspective? Well, Missouri's kind of interesting. I mean, it's got um, two population centers in the northern part of the state, which mm -hmm. tend to be kind of Democratic, and then um, here in the southern part tend to be Republican. Um, but the General Assembly is very strongly Republican. Um, the fact that, you know, the Democratic governor is no longer running, uh, you mean there's a very good chance that Republicans could take um, the governorship as well as, you know, maintain their majorities in the General Assembly. So you might get unified government, um, which is unique 
nationally, we have a tendency to have divided government where one party controls the executive and the other party controls the legislature. So even though we're recording this in late spring and we have the primaries in the summer, do you feel that there's going to be a lot more attention to the governor's race because it's going to play such a big role in mm -hmm. the state of Missouri? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The Democrats are really going to want to hold on to that because their chances of taking over the state legislature are very slim. Um, something pretty dramatic would have to happen. So the governorship is their one chance of really gaining, of keeping a foothold in the, the state politics. The state legislature at this point, because the Republicans control it so strongly, they don't let things come up to, for a vote unless they're confident they're going to win. Um, so having a governor who can veto legislation is really critical for the Democrats. Do you think this is something the voters consider, whether you have it all unified or that we want to have both parties in there to balance things out? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, voters definitely consider this idea of this balancing effect. In Missouri, though, uh, even though the governor is Democratic, there is a sort of um, veto override, right? And so they, the Republicans have a supermajority, and they, they pretty much can control the veto um, of the Democratic governor. And so what you, what you could expect is if we do get a Republican governor, um, they'll be more, much more active in policy making, but I don't think it will really change much the direction uh, of Missouri politics. And of course, Missouri, the legislature, one of the big jobs deals with the budget. Mm -hmm. And the governor plays a role in that. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's watching who deals with state services or works at state universities, mm -hmm. they want to know what's, how's this going to ultimately affect the state budget? I, well, Missouri, I think the, the tendency, I think Dr. McClady is right, is probably um, one of kind of maybe consistency, especially if um, the, the governor is aligned on the basis of partisanship with the legislature. Mm -hmm. So uh, unless other trends emerge where um, reducing right, uh, government revenue or appropriations occurs, it probably would be more consistent. Maybe it's a, you know, uh, a source of cautious optimism in that sense, that Just there shouldn't maybe be large cuts to the budget. Teamwork working Hopefully. together. So from the state perspective, we have an August primary. So the names we're starting to hear, the voters are starting to see maybe some signs going up and so forth. All those people on the parties are going to show up in August, and people then will choose a Republican or a Democratic mm -hmm. ballot. Mm -hmm. So and that's sometimes confusing to people. We had the you know, primaries for the presidential, they think, oh, it's a primary, but then the state primaries are actually where you're choosing the candidates by a vote of the people. Yeah. yeah the, the, uh, the way that I kind of describe it in class is talking about a two-stage process. So you've got the nomination and then the general, and then it turns out the nomination process tends to have less turnout, less voters relative to the general. But uh, you know, some people don't recognize that, that initial step to get to kind of the elected office. Okay. So from state perspective, people this summer will be paying attention to those candidates. Do you, may, do you anticipate a lot of campaigning? That you're, We're going to be hearing from people in southwest Missouri that want to be the governor, some of the statewide offices that are up for election? I don't expect there to be a ton of candidates, but yeah, I think this summer you're definitely going to see a lot more advertising, particularly on radio. For mm -hmm. state and local politics, radio is still a really popular choice for advertising. Yeah. And that's, you know, how do you reach people when you're campaigning? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, we could talk about that as far as, you know, we're in a media setting. You know, the local races, we saw uh, the candidates putting up yard signs, yeah, the old-fashioned yard signs yeah, and things yeah. like that. Or as you get into the media and the electronic media and social media with mm -hmm. the other elections and so forth. Well, let's transition to the national politics because I'm sure that all three of you in your classes are involved with students talking about the presidential election, what's happening. Uh, a lot of people are wondering, you know, where are we going? We have conventions coming up. Do you find that kind of confusion coming through from students as well? Yeah, well, this is one of the years where students have been the most interested in the actual election that was happening. You know, two years ago during the midterm election, there wasn't hardly this much interest, which is generally um, normal for midterm elections. Mm -hmm. But this year, students are, are very much into the process. And for some of them, this is the first time they've ever actually tried to understand what a primary election is, what delegates are, what the system is to elect these people. And so, yes, there's absolutely a huge amount of interest uh, in the 120 classes, the, lo the intro classes over okay. the process. Mm -hmm. So you'll have the intro class to get them interested, then you have your more specialized mm -hmm. classes mm -hmm. where then you can say, now here's how it actually works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the presidency course, for example, when we talk about, uh, one of the questions that seems to come up a lot is the democratic provision for superdelegates. Mm -hmm. So a lot of students um, maybe understand the idea of pledge delegates, but, but not superdelegates. Right. So we've talked a lot about that and had really spirited discussions about um, what's the purpose of those delegates, um, how does it affect public choice, right, in the context of a nomination process. So. The students are incredibly interested in the process, uh, and then too, you know, the candidates that are involved in the process. Of course, the students won't be here in those classes in the summertime when we have those actual conventions. Sure. But uh, that whole process of going through a convention is probably a big learning process. For oh yeah, people. yeah. Especially since a lot of our students are kind of coming into understanding who they are politically, and mm -hmm. so um, if they're kind of understanding who they are, then understanding the process, you know, helps them 
I think maybe to make better choices in line with whatever their interests may be. What are your feelings about the media attention? I mean, this presidential election mm -hmm. has been, I mean, you can't turn the TV on, you can't turn on and pick up a magazine without that media attention on the mm -hmm. main candidates running mm -hmm. for the presidential race. I think it happens every presidential election cycle. I think what's different this time around is that there's a couple of very colorful candidates mm -hmm. um, that are really hard to not pay attention to. Um, I think that's, it can be, problematic in some respects, but it's good in other respects because I get students coming in without sure. prompting, asking questions and what is a brokered convention mm -hmm. um, and asking about qualifications for presidents and things like that, questions that I didn't get necessarily in 2012. Mm -hmm. So the media is maybe creating some awareness for people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, media attention and name recognition are, are really important when you're running for any office, mm -hmm. right? And even in what we've been talking about Missouri local elections, there are some names already on the petition ready to go to the primary that people already know because they've held office, and those will be people to watch because they already have name recognition. But a candidate like, you know, Donald Trump, who seems to be the the, the robust candidate that's attracting so much yes. attention. He has instant media access and name recognition, which makes him um, a, able to spend far less money than the other candidates while being very competitive. Mm -hmm. So the whole nature of politics on the national level has evolved over the years. Oh yeah, I mean, it's definitely about, um, I think the, the term might be used, uh, kind of the a conflict air war. So I mean, the idea is you're, you're trying to reach mass electorates. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case of Trump, um, he, uh, Dr. McClady mentioned, I mean, that, that really gives an advantage. Um, and then you'd mentioned social media. Um, that's kind of emerging, uh, is continuing to emerge. So that there's all sorts of sources of information for voters. Of course, we're talking about younger generation traditionally mm -hmm. with the students on the college campus and so forth. Are you seeing generational differences on how people are perceiving the presidential race or the elections and how things are mm -hmm. happening or any feedback along those lines? Question. Mm -hmm. Even there are some generational yeah, differences. Yeah, I think some of the... You know, the, the students who have already formed well-organized political ideologies pretty much mirror what you would expect in the general public. Right. Um, but it is true that younger voters uh, generally support um, a more democratic or liberal candidate, but it's not always true, especially in areas like southwest Missouri. So there, I think there's strong um, student support uh, on candidates on, on both sides. And I think too, I mean, uh, the students, I mean, as Dr. Schoff mentioned, they're just, they're inquisitive. I mean, the idea is, so, you know, what's going on with these candidates, especially since some of the candidates, as mentioned, um, like uh, Donald Trump, are different right. than we've seen in the past. So I think actually the environment itself is creating maybe more interest, especially since in the context of a class, you can kind of talk about what those interests are and to try to clarify information for them. So they just seem uh, more aware. Uh, which is, you know, kind of refreshing. Kind of new for yeah, the, yeah, the country to have that yeah, yeah, <laughs> and tying that together. So you have the, uh, right now we're leading to the conventions and uh, within the parties you have people attacking each other basically, mm -hmm. you know, trying mm -hmm. to get that spot. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that when it comes to the convention that those parties will be able to then unite on be supporting a candidate, whoever they choose? Oh, that's a very difficult question. I, I mean, I mean, there I, seems to be a lot of division before you even get to the, a convention. Then you have to say, okay, now you're our party representative. There <laughs> is. That is the typical way it works. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Democrats will probably get there faster than the GOP this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but if the Republicans want to take the White House, they're going to have to, to some degree, uh, rally behind their eventual candidate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a very different year, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, Donald Trump is not well liked by the establishment. And I think it's important to know that uh, the parties set these rules. So, so the U.S. Constitution sets rules over election, right? And, and laws of the U.S. Code set rules over the election. But the way that the primaries are run is by rules set up by the party. And so a lot of people criticize both the Democratic Party for having superdelegates and the Republican Party for trying to uh, form a coup to take out Donald Trump. But when you look at it, I mean, national conventions prior to the 1950s were very closed door events where the delegates chose um, the, the candidates, not the people, right? They opened, the parties opened up the rules voluntarily. And so I think you're going to see in the Republican Party much more contention. There's going to be a fight. It, it most likely will be um, an open convention or brokered convention. With the Democrats, I think you'll see Hillary Clinton take the nomination and then the unifying, True. you know, uh, let's, let's be friends again mm -hmm. will happen. Mm -hmm. But maybe not in the Republicans. Now, do people get upset or students have questions? Why do we have a two-party system? Why are we locked into this? <laughs> yeah, we get that question a lot. And um, sort of when you, ex they pick up on it really quickly. When you start to talk to them about, well, here are some things we could do to change the United States. We, c we could create a multi-party system here. Uh, we know how to do it. 
The challenge is, is that the people who would need to make the changes are the people who are elected officials now. Who are in charge of the system. Who have absolutely no incentive to change. They've won under sure. the current system. Mm -hmm. There's no, re they have one opponent. They don't want two or three or four opponents. Um, so they pick on it very quickly. I think it sort of, it disappoints them. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it surprises them once we talk about it. Well, and to that, I mean, on that same line, I mean, a lot of students also are asking about what an independent is politically. Because we mm -hmm. know kind of generally in our minds what a Democrat and Republican is. So it, it kind of brings up this question of where an independent might fit. Um, right. And then especially with Donald Trump and others kind of making claims about running as independents. Um, so it, it is interesting in the context of two-party system, you get so much contention. You would think there'd be a lot more stability as opposed to conflict maybe in that case. So do you think our country's not quite at the point where we have an independent candidate could have a real serious run at trying to win the White House? The, the, yeah, the problem is the rules and, and all the resources mm -hmm. are in favor of the two parties. Um, but. Uh, I mean, there's a part of me that thinks, um, despite that, there could potentially be someone if they could get a big enough coalition, but it would just be incredibly difficult to challenge kind of the, the other two parties. Well, the rules are set up to produce two parties, right? right. You have single-member district plurality systems. But I think what we're seeing is a reflection of that. Within the Democratic Party and within the Republican Party, you have enormous number of factions now. And these factions, if this was a more proportional representation system like a parliamentary system, would just have their own party mm -hmm. that would get seats in the legislature and would win. But in, in our particular system, the primary is really where we see these different groups emerge be, because we don't have the ability for them to win seats in a general because it's winner take all. So, and I remember a few years ago when we had the general elections where it was so close, I mean, the Electoral College made the, you know, the mm -hmm. decision and mm -hmm. the popular vote. Do you have students who have questions about this, that, you know, we can come in November and somebody can win the majority of the votes but still not become president? <laughs> well, especially, I mean, the, the idea, if you got a, a brokered convention where a candidate were to go independent and they were to win Electoral College votes, I mean, it would be incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they actually have a question about, so what happens if you don't get one candidate with an absolute majority? Um, so we c in the presidency course, we talk about you know uh, how there's a provision um, for a different selection mechanism. But a lot of the students initially say, well, why the electoral college and not direct popular election? Right. That's kind of the big source of friction for them. And so the just understanding where that electoral college yeah, came from, exactly, how yeah. can we have this mm -hmm. system? Why yeah. doesn't you know just mm -hmm. straight across the board whoever wins wins? Yeah, exactly. They they, they um, have a tendency to be skeptical of the electoral college. Although I mean, there's some arguments to be made for protecting state interests in the context of presidential elections and things mm -hmm. like that, what the Electoral College does. So, I mean, it's just, um, with a presidential election in the background, um, it really makes the class more in, um, interesting in that case. And of course, we have the presidential election, and you still have battles for the U.S. Congress, mm -hmm. you know, House mm -hmm. and Senate, and there's that whole partisan issue that people are sometimes complaining about, you mm -hmm. know, and you can't get anything done in Congress because mm -hmm. nobody talks to each other, you mm -hmm. know. So are you hearing from students, you know, as far as, well, even if we had so-and-so elected president, we still can't get things done because mm -hmm. of Congress mm -hmm. or something like that? I hear that quite a bit from upper division students, sure. mm. uh, not so much the freshmen who mm. come in. Um, I, we, in the United States, we have an inflated view of what our president can do. Mm. Uh, we assume that the president is much more powerful uh, than they are as an individual. The office uh, is limited. Mm. Uh, part of this is because presidential candidates will promise us the stars and the moon right. to get elected, uh, knowing full well that the things they're promising us, they wouldn't have the legal authority to give us. Mm. Um, and so it takes some time for students to sort of either walk them back and, they may have promised that, but they can't do that. It takes Congress to make that happen exactly. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Tie that together. And I know you deal with international relations. Are you hearing students that are concerned about, you know, what's happening in the world now and how our elections will result in, you know, affect America standing in the world? Absolutely. I mean, it's going to be it's very important. This, this won't necessarily be what we would call a wartime or election or a foreign policy election, <laughs> but foreign policy will play a big role. And it's really important to listen to what your presidential candidates are saying about what they're going to do in the foreign policy world. Because it will, certain things that certain candidates are saying will clearly alienate countries that we have really good working relationships with. And like Professor Schroff was saying, um, presidents can't just do what, whatever they want, right? So even though something might sound wonderful and maybe sound like something you want them to do, you have to be careful about how that will reflect on the, national, the international stage. And also you have to be careful about how the, that will affect sort of um, your citizens internally who have connections with the outside world. So the world is watching the United States. Absolutely, this election. absolutely. President Obama was a very popular selection mm -hmm. in 2008. He still remains pretty popular, actually, internationally, despite not being so popular at home. Although he's, his public approval still is around 48, 50 percent. Um, but you know, there are there are certain candidates that the that the world or external uh, actors are are I don't want to say frightened of, but not too fond of because mm -hmm. of the sort of bluster that they've been 
mm-hmm. talking about. So it goes beyond just electing someone, it's the years that follow sure. that people are looking at mm-hmm. down the road. Mm-hmm. Well, we've been talking about students, I want to make sure we have some information for people as far as you know, they come in as freshmen in the fall. Some of them are 18. They haven't registered to vote. I know your department has had programs in the past mm-hmm. to, you know, encourage them, register to vote. And, you know, if you're here in Joplin, register to vote here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> are you planning those types of things in the fall? I believe so, yeah. I mean, the, the idea, I mean, at least in my courses, I always kind of emphasize the importance of not just registration, but, I mean, being active politically. It's mm-hmm. really sometimes difficult um, to convince, uh, as you said, really young, young students, yeah. you know, to get participating. Um, but. Uh, at least in my course and the things that we read and talk about, I try to get them to be you know, motivated. To, and, and it turns out students actually always have questions about where to register um, because, you know, they maybe are coming from, you know, a different mm-hmm. area of Missouri. And so we kind of talk about the logistics of, you know, making sure that they can register here and vote here as opposed to where they came from. Voting back yeah. home and there, yeah. 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 Trying to carry it through that way. Mm-hmm. And then the student involvement. I know we've had student organizations that are the young Democrats and Republicans. Are we going to have, anticipate having those groups active in the fall as well? So I don't know if the young partisan groups are going to be active. We have a uh, political science association mm-hmm. that okay. got started last fall um, that's a bipartisan organization mm-hmm. of students, mostly poli-sci majors, but not exclusively with students from across campus. And they're going to be very active. They're already starting to plan initial events debate watching parties Mm -hmm. in the fall, uh, voter registration drives. Um, They're all very excited and are looking forward to being active on campus in the local community. So this is an exciting time for your majors in political science. Oh, yes. This is a wonderful time to be Mm -hmm. a poli-sci major, absolutely. Well, for example, I mean, we offer like uh, upper division courses in elections during, you know, the fall when we have Mm -hmm. a presidential election. So it just kind of naturally coincides. Um, It's my case, you know, you're a political scientist, it's great. I mean, you got an election. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) And from your perspective as professors, is it something that after the elections, there's study and analysis and what happened and how it happened and things like that? Yeah. Well, this election seems to be very different because of some of the candidates. So I think there's going to be a a lot more reflection, at least within courses and then, you know, um, Mm -hmm. in the broader community about the outcome. So I think I'm kind of excited about the possibility of doing that in the fall. So it's nice to have something a little bit new every once in a while, a different turn to how things are happening. Absolutely. Yep. And I just want to say uh, the Center for Law and Politics, Spradling Center for Law and Politics, Mm -hmm. will have voter registration drives at our third Thursday uh, event. So if you're looking for it, we'll have Kansas registration, we'll have Missouri registration, we'll mail them for you. And so if you're not registered yet uh, and you're there, come on out to our table and we'll make sure to get you registered. Great. So there's no excuse. Just show up and spill out that paper. Just come down (laughs) and we'll do it. Take care of it. And Missouri voters can register to vote online. That's true. That's right. Uh, So it's very cool. You can sit there at your computer on your sofa uh, Mm -hmm. and do it there as well. And for people who are in town in August, remind them that that August primary is coming up, that they need to vote for that as well. You need to register 30 days. In advance of that August primary. Yep, and if you're a student who's not going to be in your uh, local precinct, mm-hmm. you should register for an absentee ballot. It only takes a few minutes, and you'll mm-hmm. still be able to vote no matter where you live. Yeah. Great. Well, I'd like to thank the three of you for sharing information for our audience today. And like I said, it's an election year, and I'm sure you will be very involved with your students as this semester wraps up, and especially when fall picks up after we know who the candidates are for the president mm-hmm. and moving forward from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. And I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for joining us this week on Newsmakers. I'm Judy Stiles. I'll see you again next week at the same time on the station.